Tu podcast. W głowie się mieści. So uh, on my uh, today episode, uh, my guest, Professor Stefan Hoffman, uh, he is uh, Alexander for Humboldt Professor in Department of Clinical Psychology at Philips University, Merbuk, Merbuk Lan, Germany, and the Professor of Psychology in Department of Psychological and Brain Science at Boston University and he is an author and the chief of the cognitive therapy uh, and research and developer of process-based cognitive behavioral therapy. So hello, Stefan, professor, hello. Um, you are also an author of a lot of books about uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the many of them were published in Poland, uh, like uh, the process-based CBT, um, which is like uh, almost a Bible of the modern cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and we are waiting on September. We'll have another uh, new release from the GWP. It's beyond DSM. Uh, and another, uh, it's like a self-help book, which I also very like. Uh, it's a, the, 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 the translation from Polish is the Beyond Anxiety, yeah, which is the self-help book. Yeah, and you are probably for everyone and a well-known person and for maybe for those people who maybe know you little less, Maybe you will introduce yourself, like say something about yourself if we ask you who is Stefan Hoffman, so <laughs> okay. <be> an answer. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist, um, was trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, my main mentors uh, are uh, Dr. Aaron T. Beck, um, uh, who I had the pleasure of um, uh, of uh, meeting many times and getting trained uh, in his approach and also being trained as a CBD supervisor. And then also David Barlow, an anxiety researcher, Anke Ehlers, also an anxiety researcher. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm German uh, and I grew up in Germany and I uh, went um, to the States uh, on a um, um, on a doctoral uh, dissertation <clears throat> fellowship to study anxiety disorders at Stanford University in the early 90s um, when I was, uh, uh, you know, in my late 20s, uh, early 30s. And that's when I kind of um, um, uh, 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 kind of started falling in love, I guess, with uh, research, uh, falling mm -hmm. in love also uh, with the with the U.S. to some extent, and then I, um, uh, after um, uh, positions at Stanford University and uh, and uh, uh, Albany uh, University of Albany, upstate New York, I then uh, joined Boston University in 1996 and uh, was at Boston University for some 25, 60, uh, 26 years, and then recently relocated to Germany. Uh, uh, receiving a Alexander von Humboldt uh, a, a professorship and award, uh, and I've been here again uh, for about a year at the University of Marburg, which is my alma mater. Um, but uh, holding joint appointments both at Boston University and um, and the and University of Marburg. My interests are uh, broadly defined, uh, um, obviously psychotherapy research, trying to understand what works in psychotherapy, in particular therapy for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my um, early work has been on very specific anxiety disorders, uh, in particular social anxiety disorder. And then I branched out to other forms of anxiety disorders. And then, uh, and then uh, more recently developed a more um, general uh, models of uh, psychotherapy research of uh, identifying core processes that seem to underlying underlie uh, any types of uh, effective psychotherapy. I've been trans uh, working closely with uh, various uh, 
um, experts in, in neighboring disciplines, in particular psychiatry. I've been doing um, uh, work in, in pharmacological augmentation of mm -hmm. psychotherapy. Um, in, um, I've been working closely with uh, neuroscientists, in particular Joseph Ledoux, who's an anxiety researcher. We've been working closely together in trying to, under, trying to understand anxiety disorders also on the neuro, neurobiological level, but also how to translate mm -hmm. Um, recent discoveries in neuroscience into um, uh, psychotherapy. Uh, and um, I'm also um, um, uh, now working closely with, um, with neuroimaging researchers in trying to uh, not only visualize what is happening in the brain, but also to predict psychotherapy. So the, the overarching uh, theme has always been uh, understanding uh, uh, psychological therapies and uh, trying to improve upon what we know, um, in particular, uh, using neuroscience methods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, like you are uh, using like the newest knowledge and um, the also techniques to develop the cognitive behavioral therapy and the th therapy of the anxiety disorders in general. Yeah, and I would say now uh, mood and anxiety disorders and in general um, uh, psychopathological states. So I wouldn't now limit myself to an anxiety researcher mm -hmm. uh, only. Okay. So I would, um, uh, I, I think I, I have branched out considerably into um, any forms of um, psychopathology at this point. Yeah. yeah. And um, like from uh, the most of your professional life, uh, you have used the classical, like let we say classical cognitive behavioral therapy and the protocols for treating like syndromes. And what inspired you to look for something else? Because like we know that um, you start to develop the trans, trans diagnostic approach. So what was the main points, like the key factors that like made you, that you shift from, from the tr diagnostic, uh, diag diagnostical manuals to trans diagnostical approach? I think um, we have accomplished a great deal in our field in psychotherapy, um, despite the fact that it has still not is still not widely disseminated and and used. But still, in terms of uh, studies, randomized controlled studies, one can say that uh, we've done reasonably well, but um, we seem to have reached a plateau. Um, the, um, the the therapy uh, approaches. Um, that we have developed uh, over the years are really tailored to um, uh, psychopathological models and are not mm -hmm. tailored to the individual. So in at the beginning of, um, of this journey that I have um, uh, embarked upon, we, we, I, it was started, it, it, it stopped, began with a, contra with a controversy, with a theoretical controversy with a um, another prominent figure who has, has been a very major uh, influence in my life is Steve Hayes, who is also right. developer of ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy. And over the years, we've been battling um, sort of in during uh, professional conferences, uh, yeah, panel discussions and others. Uh, we've been sort of fighting with one another, uh, in particular over 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 details about uh, I would say theoretical details they are nevertheless important but but uh, in terms of practical implications not dramatically uh, significant uh, about the role of cognitions about about uh, about uh, context about relational frames that he has uh, uh, developed and uh, and um, I thought always he uh, act had a very simplistic and inaccurate perspective on the role of cognitions and in, in psychopathology. So I, uh, me as a, as a primary proponent of the traditional cognitive behavioral model and Hayes as a, as a, as a, obviously the, uh, a proponent of the so-called third wave movement, uh, after, um, numerous debates, um, we kind of, uh, well, we, we started listening to each other. Um, more, mm -hmm. I would say we okay. we um, we had a uh, 
there was a significant event actually during a, a particular um, um, meeting uh, that occurred about, I think about, about 15 years ago now at the conference in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, where we had another debate and, uh, and Steve, uh, Steve Hayes, um, uh, had a medical emergency. He collapsed on stage and I, I ended up okay. in an emergency room with him. Uh, and we were concerned, very much concerned about his health. We thought he had a heart attack. It turned out not to be a, uh, a significant event. Um, so it was corrected, but, um, but we thought that would be sort of the last few minutes of his life. Then we connected on a very personal level, stayed, uh, during the night, uh, holding hands, crying at three, four o'clock in the morning. It turned out to be, uh, just a big scare. Uh, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we, we connected on a, on a human level. Uh, and we also talked a lot about our differences in our views during these well, I must have stayed there five, six hours in the emergency room. And we thought this is, um, this odd event, uh, can't be forgotten. And we started, uh, communicating via phone after that event, uh, simply to initially to chat how he's doing. And, 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 uh, and then we thought there were a lot of, uh, commonalities that we discussed, a lot of, um, Connecting Did points. Something like that, that connected uh, each other. Basically. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I think we both, uh, identified what we really want is, is, is to improve, um, our, our views, our, our views of psychopathology that we thought, both thought that this was very simplistic and incorrect, that, uh, um, we are, we, we really should focus much more on the individual, on the individual client, much more so than we have done. Also what, uh, the much more so than these third, so-called third wave approaches now have been done. We're too technique focused, too strategy bound. Uh, and we are developing models of psychopathology, but not of, uh, the, the person's problems. Um, uh, these mm -hmm. models are, uh, arise during uh, early, the early walkings in therapy where uh, every good clinician sort of is not guided by the diagnosis, but every good clinician is listening to the client's uh, specific uh, uh, problems, history, trying to make sense of what, what is maintaining the problem, what is causing the problem. Um, uh, the diagnostic approach that we've been using that all, that all psychiatry, all clinical um approaches I've been using is, is very simplistic in, in a labeling a person based on a, a so-called latent disease that, that a person has depression, a person has panic disorder, a person mm -hmm. has schizophrenia, yeah. manic disorder, a, a, a bipolar disorder, etc. As if we have a, a, a virus that we carry in us that we call, let's see, COVID-19 virus, and then uh, well, we no, know no. exactly how to treat it, right? We know yeah. how it's been caused. And we have such a very simplistic idea also about mental disorders. Uh, uh, it, it is, most people would say, well, yeah, that's, that's uh, a, a simplification. But yes, it is, it, 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 we, we, we hold that. We still believe that there's a, some, something that, ex, that finally explains depression, that finally explains by panic disorder. Yet, when we look at the individual, we see this heterogeneity of suffering. Um, that we cannot capture with this, uh, with this, with this label. Uh, so in a way, the diagnostic statistical manual, the, um, uh, the, uh, ICD, um, or other systems that have been used in the past are, um, are based on a, on a, on a medical model of the human, of the, of the, of human suffering. And, uh, uh, we all, uh, uh, even the most biologically oriented psychiatrists would say, yeah, certainly you will also have to consider context. You will have to consider culture. You will have to consider the his person's history, et cetera. Uh, we would argue that these are not uh, simply uh, conditions you would need to consider, but they are actually central to understand the issue. Pro uh, the, the, the person, uh, person's problems forms, uh, forms a network of problems. Uh, so a person's history affects the current state, affects the current, let's say, uh, uh, interpersonal uh, response to particular individuals. Mm -hmm. That in turn uh, uh, affects the person's way of thinking, the way of behaving, the way of uh, experiencing a particular uh, situation. Um, 
uh, that in the in the larger social cultural context embedded, we need to understand this complexity of uh, human suffering. Once we do that, once we understand the network, the problem network that people are dealing with, then we can effectively intervene. Then we know what is driving a problem. So we're not we're concerned about what maintains a person's um, suffering. Um, we we are not made to suffer. We are made to to live. We 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 are yeah. we are searching for meaningful lives. Uh, we want to to be in essence happy, and we are often stuck in various situations. Uh, uh, may be because we we are we think that that's what we have to do to go through, or that's what we're forced to do, etc. Um, and certainly, there are biological correlates. We are nobody is 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 normal. <laughs> we are all yeah. abnormal. This yeah. concept of abnormality is is dramatically incorrect. That we're striving toward a fictitious um, uh, optimal state that never exists. We are all we're all abnormal, and yeah. and so this, we need to give up this 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 normality idea that we need to fix ourselves to to meet this uh, this standard that doesn't exist. The the, yeah. the 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 average person is a fictitious statistical uh, uh, um, um, entity that doesn't exist. We do not have an average person. Yeah, so we are. Who is, yeah. Someone who is one hundred percent average, so uh, also could be abnormal because, like you said, there exactly, is no <laughs> it is abnormal. Average. It is abnormal to be normal, if you will. <laughs> but we are we grow up in that re very much in this mindset. Uh, we 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 are sort of this this idea of the normal distribution is ingrained in us that that's what we're operating on when we do statistics that's what we believe oh we are deviating from from this this thing called normality and we need to move ourselves toward this normality idea once we kind of understand that this is actually an as fundamentally incorrect yeah. assumption it opens mm -hmm. up a big big world of uh, not only um, clinical practice but also research that we that we now we don't need to uh, tie ourselves to it. so but also I have to say these are very fundamental issues yeah. fundamental uh, uh, questions we're, we're targeting that also you know make us need to rethink the way we are doing science in in uh, in our field. Yes, because this is also related to my question. Another one, um, do we need the medical classification in the psychotherapy? But from the perspective of the research and from the perspective of the clinicians and psychologists, well, how do you think? Uh, yeah. And this needs to go hand in hand much more so. So we, are, we're, we, we the, the traditional paradigm has been that we're studying diagnostic disorders, pathology, and randomized controlled trials, assuming that they're all sharing very similar, if not the same, uh, features. Yes. Uh, at some point, we would identify what causes these problems. Uh, we still don't know, but but we assume that at some point we can identify neurocircuitries, brain circuitries, genes, hormones, um, maybe maybe also psychological processes that clearly link, uh, are linked and, and cause this particular problem. But maybe yeah. this is not the case. Maybe, maybe a person's problems are self-maintained because a person, uh, the pathology, psychopathology, we see as a, as an, as a, as an, as a uh, maladaptive, network it is mm -hmm. uh, uh, we are networked not only between individuals we're networked what you you found me through the internet which is networked yeah. we are now people are accessing this this podcast because of these networks but also we <laughs> as an individual described yes in your book uh, yeah which is like on the beginning we can see there the networks of the even life events the things that we learned and how it affects our here and now. Yeah. So yeah. 
And this network idea broadens our our horizon, our perspective, because we detach ourselves from simplistic uh, um, ideas of what causes a problem. That is yeah. very critical. We actually, this cause, this issue of cause, in a way, process-based therapy is, a, is, is, I often call it a why therapy. We're constantly asking the question, why? Why? That is the critical issue. The why question. In many ways, and, but always why. <laughs> yeah, it goes yeah. back to why, and certainly. But no, just knowing knowing what initiates something does not explain why something is being maintained, obviously. You can mm -hmm. have trauma in the past and some person develops a very adaptive uh, and 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 healthy life and another person is struggling with these. Uh, so the, this, so what, what is it that maintains problems in the here and now yeah. that is still the, the question of why uh, obviously captures causality. And there are many things that are, that, that we, that, that, that probably are included in this answer. Biological factors are certainly one, w one answer to the why question, but also what maintains What, what, what are the behaviors that maintain your problem? What are your viewpoints that maintain the problem? What are the individuals that, you, that you're engaging in that maintain the problem? What are your goals that maintain the problem? Maybe, maybe, maybe these are things also that you need to change. Maybe you want to, want to be somewhere completely different than where you are and you will never reach that issue. These are broad questions. Uh, yeah. and, and we can only understand the complexity of human pathology if we also approached it from a complex, uh, uh, allowing this complexity to be represented in, in a complex model. Um, we can't, it, it's impossible to capture the entirety uh, of the complexity, but we need to, uh, we need to uh, have a, find a, a common, a, a middle ground where we, where the complexity is, is reflected without being, mm -hmm completely overwhelming us as a clinician uh, and yet not reducing it to a to a stereotypical simple label what we have been doing also i have to say you know the psychological orientations that we carry with us the ideas of oh this is causing a problem it's made be schemas made be uh Cognitive cognitions, maybe yes. behaviors, etc. Mm -hmm. All of this limits our views, uh, and thereby reduces the. Uh, we're putting a lens uh, yeah. uh, on us that 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 filters out only certain things and and ignores others. And we we need to widen that, broaden that. And clinicians should be uh, should capture as much of the complexity as possible. Oh, great. So it's like we also, uh, as a, um, people that do researches, uh, we can also um, focusing on the one side of the problem and not seeing the other one. Yeah. Exactly right. Yes. So um, we we it is it is. Uh, I, I don't like the word eclectic, but but it does it does capture uh, some aspects of it because we need to be be okay with stepping outside of our own uh, our, our own bubbles, our yeah. own uh, um, framework of thinking, um, and and broaden that. Um, but we but we we need at the same time a overarching model. We need at the same time some we not and we can't. We can't let people say, "Look, anything goes," uh, because then it's then it, there are as many um, types of pathologies as as there are clinicians assessing individuals, and as many yeah. individuals as there are, that obviously would not be meaningful. So we need a f overarching framework, and this overarching framework, I'd like to spend a little time on that, is uh, provides is is provided by evolutionary science. Mm -hmm. So let me just say a few words about that because yeah, it's essential sure. to understand process-based yeah. therapy. Uh, psychopathology is not caused by a latent disease. First, psychopathology mm -hmm. is a, a result of maladaptation to a given context. That's how we define and how we see how we, this is our 
basic assumption. Psychopathology is a result of maladaptation to a given context. Any Anything that you do is context-dependent. Um, if you... Um, uh, even the interview uh, right now. Yeah. Even the interview right now. Uh, if I if I, I I could say the same sentence in a different in a different context and would make no sense whatsoever what I'm saying. It could insult people. It could be. It could be. Uh, I could be. Uh, I could feel. Uh, I, I could. I could create uh, uproar or or I could also create some positive emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. not, nothing can be seen out of context, and that's why often, you know, people grab some some uh, some sayings that people said uh, you know and out of context it seems yeah. horrible but you need to see yeah. context you assume context the, for yeah. things to 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 be perceived as as horrible but because you, you assume a, a different context than, yeah. than there is context is essential to understand pathology any behavior in a dif in a different culture in a different context might actually be seen as quite normal normal uh, than uh, um, uh, than in another context uh, it is it is uh, well, what's what's essential is that um, in order to to be healthy if you will to be uh, to live meaningful and uh, and and uh, happy lives uh, your life needs to match a context and you can be happy in, 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 in almost any context, depending on how you uh, arrange uh, uh, the, this, the, your, your approach toward that. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. hard to, 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 to capture that. And you can easily think of extreme examples, but then I would argue, well, it, it, we, we don't need to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, um, accept any context it is not to say that we need to now live with any environmental situational uh factors that are presented to us no not at all we might say well this context needs to change because we can influence it we yeah. can influence it we can influ influence our environment and the context is obviously to a great degree influenced by our environment and we have the willpower to do that so in a way we uh Still, nevertheless, its adaptation is uh, is required to a given context for you to be um, uh, to to feel like that, that there's not much friction and you can move move along. Okay, so context context is present it presents itself. You you have a, a way to to influence context, uh, but psychopathology is maladaptation to a given context. When is maladap when does maladaptation occur? Maladaptation occurs in a given context if there are problems in variation and or selection and or retention. Let me explain that what that means. Yeah, it was my um, question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, on the behavioral level, it's pretty straightforward to explain. Mm -hmm. Variation is, any context always changes. Yeah. Context will never stay the same. Sometimes context changes slowly. Sometimes it is influenced by by uh, our uh, the purposeful willpower to move it in a particular direction. Sometimes it's just random, but context always changes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Yeah. Um, and for that reason, variation is essential. If we always do on a behavioral level uh, one thing in a given context, you will at some point show maladaptation because context changes. Um, in order to be to show adaptation, uh, uh, whatever behavior you, you uh, in the case of behavior, uh, uh, a particular behavioral approach is adaptive, another behavioral approach is maladaptive, and you need to select what seems to work in a given context, and mm -hmm. you need to retain whatever you have selected that seems to work in a given context. Let me give an example. You have a set of keys, and you need to open a door. Um, yeah. Now, uh, it would make little sense if you just chose any random key and just keep keep forcing the key into the lock um since Break it. it's yeah. highly highly likely that the, any random key doesn't 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 uh doesn't Work. open this yeah. door you might have been very lucky but most of the time you need to vary you need to show variation until you find select the right key that 
seems to open this door. You then retain that. You kind of remember, oh, this key opens that door. So you don't have to v uh, show variation all the time with this given in a given context. Variation, selection, retention. Now, I assume you come to a next door, to another door with a different lock. It wouldn't make any sense now uh, uh, to keep doing what you've been doing because the context has changed. You need to go back to variation, selection, and retention. There are many examples that happen. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are guided by evolutionary principles in our everyday lives. Everything you do, every, every minuscule detail you show uh, is guided by a variation, selection, retention in a given context. And problems often arise in pathological states because we think mm -hmm. this is the way it needs to work and we stick to it. We show problems in variation, meaning flexibility. Flexibility is often a overarching, very essential initial state. Now, you don't want to need to show that the, 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 the critical issue is not to be overly flexible. You don't want to be, you need to show healthy flexibility, healthy yeah. variation, also healthy selection, uh, select carefully what seems to work and healthy retention. Don't stick to one thing or, uh, or also don't let, uh, or you have to let go at some point uh, or, but you need to hold on. Behavioral, so it's about the balance. Um, yeah. Between um, it needs um, to be healthy. Being healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Being not being also too flexible because uh, it also could cause the problems. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Healthy variation, healthy selection, healthy retention in a given context determines um, uh, whether it's maladaptation or, or adaptation. In one case, maladaptation is, we would call psychopathology. Adaptation is healthy uh, uh, state. Uh, this not only happens on the behavioral level, mm -hmm. uh, like forcing your key in a lock uh, or anything that you can think of uh, that you do on a behavioral level, but also you might come up with examples on a cognitive level. Let's, let's say people who have a very rigid way of thinking uh, mm -hmm. that don't easily see other, another perspective that only see yeah. it from one point of view, uh, or you have, uh, you may show healthy variation, but then you, you, you choose an, an, a maladaptive way of looking at it. Uh, that is an unhealthy selection, or perhaps you, you then stick to, one particular perspective and you retain that regardless of context. And you might, you will, in this, this is another example of it's very similar to behavior when cognitions also follow the same principles of variation, selection, retention in a given context. Also the way you, you, uh, you, uh, you, sh uh, uh, how your affective system, your emotional system operates. Some people show very flat emotions, show, or some people are overly emotional in any context, show extreme variation. Others, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maladaptive variation. Others show, um, you may choose to, to, um, uh, uh, you may uh, uh, have an emotional response, uh, select the wrong emotional response to a given situation or retain that and kind of are are stuck in your emotional state and are unable to, to let go. Or perhaps you are too quick to let go of an emotion and then switch. Okay, the, mm -hmm. the affective system, we talked about the cognitive system, behavioral system. We can also think of attentional okay. systems. Mm -hmm. We can think of um, where people are ruminating over things or uh, or their, their, their mind is all over the place. We can think of social interpersonal systems mm -hmm. where you uh, uh, where you show these uh, issues. Um, so we, we developed a, uh, a an overarching e um, evolutionary extended evolutionary meta model um, where affective system attention, cognition, behavior, motivational system, um, interpersonal, cultural systems are following, follow these, these very simple uh, principles of problems and variation, selection and retention in a given context. Yeah, so as uh, clinicians, we do uh, a conceptualization that is based on the revolutionary science. Yeah, and we are searching on which level our client uh, has developed some problems like exactly. Stuck exactly. On the cognitions or is it the emotions and how to how we can push those processes into the uh, more adaptive way to Correct. copying.
Yeah. So in a way, we call it process-based therapy because these are overarching processes. Yeah. So problems in variation, selection, retention, these are higher level processes that give rise to lo some lower level processes. An example of rumination is a lower level uh, process on the cognitive dimension uh, involving uh, in this case, retention, you're overly, you're retaining one way mm -hmm. of thinking over, uh, be, as, oh, as if you're mm -hmm. stuck in a particular mode of thinking. Um, uh, uh, again, so processes are, are things that, that change as a result of changes in context. Uh, mm -hmm. And those processes underlie therapy. Uh, that's, those are the things that we need to, to identify what are those maladaptive processes and then therapeutically intervene in such a way that they become adaptive, that we move them, that we either disturb the process if it's, or mm -hmm. to convert that, keep the process as it is, but then convert it into the different context. It's also a possibility that the, the process, you know, you, you want to, in order to be successful, you absolutely have to be perseverant and, and keep going at it uh, in order to reach what you desire. But then now you turn this rather, this can be very um, maladaptive in interpersonal context where uh, a, 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 being, a person being perseverant, being perceived as, as rigid and, and, uh, and and not flexible and, yeah. and not giving up uh, a goal. But again, it, context matters in that regard greatly yes and um describing the process based cbt in the nutshell what do you use some special skills or techniques to influence those processes like yeah so uh, we we believe that a lot of uh, i think there are uh, in the future specific skills that that are uh that are uniquely suited to target a complex network um i think we we do believe that there might mm -hmm. be something in the on the horizon however for the time being you can conduct process based therapy using what you know works so we have a set of the in that's how we described it in our uh process based cbt book mm -hmm. that that basically describes the various evidence-based procedures, strategies that every clinician should be familiar with. Um, whether your process-based approach, uh, you, you, you buy into process-based approach or not, you should be familiar with those strategies. You should know how to, how to do behavioral, uh, uh, to do an exposure. Uh, you should know how to uh, do cognitive restructuring, how to um, uh, enhance motivation, how to, um, uh, intervene on behavioral levels to, to, mm -hmm. to break contingencies, et cetera, et cetera. There are, uh, this list is maybe 13, 14 or so different strategies that every clinician should know. These are the <laughs> building blocks that we believe need to be put together in a way that suits a given individual in order to, per to perturbate, to disturb a complex network with a goal to uh, uh, to move the person along. Yeah. So it's, uh, evidence-based things that works for the individual here. Yeah. So as I, uh, understand good and that we are searching what, what would work for the individual that we are working with. Yeah. Correct. And, you know, the often a criticism that we get is, well, isn't it, then wouldn't we have as many networks as we have individuals? In mm -hmm. a way that is yes, but at the same time, there are certain individuals that resemble each other. There are some networks that are more alike than others. Yeah. And uh, we are starting from the ground up, trying to see if there are clusters of networks that are more likely to be that, that got grouped together. There might be people who say those ruminators might mm -hmm. actually form similar networks than those uh, individuals who have problems in, in activating themselves. Uh, okay. Yeah. So those kind of 
uh, this is very simplistic, uh, but yeah. there are statistical methods, uh, uh, ways to group networks uh, together that are more alike. Uh, doing this is now a much more meaningful way of developing a new form of classification that mm -hmm. is directly treatment relevant because we once we know the network it automatically it directly tells you how to intervene because you mm -hmm. understand what the loops are that maintain a problem you understand where the pro uh, problematic central nodes are that seem to maintain the problem how it's being uh, uh, any positive self reinforcing loops um, that 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 keep the the problem alive this is a direct this directly links to the approach often when we do process based therapy by simply the very insight that people gain by plotting this network of their own problems plotting this the the, the network itself is a therapeutic tool that mm -hmm. they gain inf insight into, oh, I guess that's what, what drives this. And, and as a result, they change that. The network always changes, by the way. Over the course of therapy, we, we need to uh, very frequently reassess that. We, it cannot be a, a roadmap uh, a, uh, that, that, that is a uh, that is set in stone that uh, that is then uh, being followed to the end not the least a network also changes even if you don't intervene uh, because some, some things happen in the person's life or perhaps of the very insight that uh, uh, what the network creates so networks always need to change uh, uh, mm -hmm. always need to I'm sorry you need to reassess a network because networks always change so do we can find this um, like a new approach um, to the classification in the, your new book beyond the SM? Like what, like, would you do a, like a little, you know, a trailer introduction, what, what, what we can find there? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The, the book uh, beyond the SM was actually uh, the, that was the very starting out point. So we are in, um, uh, we're in good contact and close, we have close relationships with the publisher New Harbinger Press. That McCain in particular is a psychologist himself, the, the, uh, who's now just recently stepped down as, a, as, a, but he created, a, he, he, uh, he, uh, he started that, uh, uh, publishing house. And, um, and so he was, uh, we convinced him that we should g gather a, a group. Uh, of people with different perspectives on 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 classification, so we um, we invited uh, uh, a representative um, by the DSM, by the ICD, um, a representative by the NI National Institute of Mental Health, who created their own classification system called Re uh, uh, Research Domain Criteria, or also called RDOC. Uh, we uh, um, invited people with um, expertise in network. Uh, in in um, in in various statistical uh, approaches, um, and we gathered them in a in a uh, think tank like uh, setting, uh, mm -hmm. hammering out what are the pros and cons of the various approaches, and is there a way forward? What are what are the weaknesses that you represent also, and is there a way forward? So this book is in a way a a um, reflection of this discussion. It doesn't necessarily will not, so the reader will be a bit disappointed if they want if they want to know now know how this is the new net the new classification should look like. Yeah. But rather, it looks at it from different perspectives, identifies the problems, and then we believe that uh, our 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 extended evolutionary meta model that I presented. Uh, mm -hmm. is from a process-based approach, a very good first step, maybe even uh, an advanced step in this classification. Because you don't need a label. You need to understand how problems are connected. The label, if anything, of depression or bipolar, etc. the label is uh, uh, kind of misguides you. It, it, it deters uh, it, it kind of shifts your focus uh, away from the person, and that's the problem. Okay. 
So um, it is also like the good knowledge for people who want to learn this new approach, the process-based and how to um, adapt it into our clinical work. Yeah. Yes, I think that that would be, um, mm. it, it really does um, um, sort of lay out the the issues around classification and different approaches of, of doing that. Yeah. Great. And um, from your point of view, what is the future of uh, maybe the process-based therapy and also um, in general uh, therapy? Yeah. So I, th uh, so we, we, we just recently um, um, had a, a think tank meeting here at the University of Marburg, um, mm -hmm. where I invited uh, also Steve, Steve Hayes and I, we basically co-hosted uh, it and uh, invited uh, uh, both a number of um, uh, basic science researchers and clinical applied researchers uh, in a think tank like uh, forum uh, meet, meeting for three days and and, re, and and targeting this very issue. Where's the future? Where, where are we going mm -hmm. next? Um, I just want to mention a few uh, names. Uh, Joe, so our fellow travelers, Joe Chiarochi at uh, um, uh, Australian Catholic University is a very um, important partner in that. Uh, also Katie Gates, uh, she's a, um, a statistician uh, at Penn State uh, who's um, who's developed methodological approaches to um, um, to develop um, a new ways of classifying these issues? We termed even a new uh, we we came up with a new term so that uh, that is uh, that captures the idea of going from ideographic to a nomothetic approach. So mm -hmm. nomothetic approach meaning we group everybody together and then we're looking at at these variables that uh, all yes. people share, and then you can come up with an average and so forth. That's a nomothetic approach, an ideographic meaning that you're looking at this single individual. And we are, we termed uh, something called idionomic. So we are using an ideographic approach in order to derive uh, groups, in order to 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 come up with a uh, nomothetic-like system, but that is, however, uh, based in an ideographic approach. Uh, it is really based on the very, uh, and it's a bit of a esoteric discussion, but um, but I should mention it because it's relevant uh, of uh, um, of a uh, 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 of ergodicity. Uh, uh, so the uh, ergodicity is an is an is a term in 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 um, uh, in, in physics uh, that uh, you can make assumptions about uh, groups of individuals if you know the groups you can you can infer what a single individual looks like only if they all share if all individuals in the group share a lot of things in common uh, yeah. uh, stationarity etc so the and these are very strong assumptions that are too strong to may, be meaningful well, in other words like cultural um influences well, even even mm -hmm. um even on a so uh, uh, the ergodic theorem states that that uh, gas molecules um, uh, only uh, 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 can can that you can make assumptions about each single molecule knowing the the entirety of the gas volume only if all molecules share the same features uh, in terms of um, a number of kind of statistical uh, assumptions, and that is never met. In other words, we 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 operate on 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 the wrong assumptions in statistics when we do statistics. Uh, we group people together, assuming that they are sharing this one variable in common. But the problem is that this is not the only variable that they have in common. They have a lot of other things that differ uh, among them. As a result, we cannot make assumptions from groups to the individual. Yeah. Uh, that's where the term idionomic comes in because it, 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 it is mindful of this ergodic problem that we are dealing with. Anyway, so we, we have uh, uh, discussed a lot of the, a number of kind of philosophical, mythological issues in that, in that, mm -hmm. um, in that think tank. And then we are um, now implementing um, we're gathering uh, a lot of data and have captured a number of our friends in Germany. I should mention also uh, my friend Uli Stangier, who's uh, who's also done uh, 
uh, research in, in related areas that I've been doing. And Winfried Rief, he's a, he's the, uh, my colleague at the University of Marburg and many others, um, uh, 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 a colleague from, uh, University of Greifswald, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we all kind of work together now to gather data, uh, process based data. Uh, and uh, form a, a a large network of uh, clinics that uh, that uh, that we uh, we do also. Uh, Michael Svitek, at, at the, he has an entire clinic who has published a German book with me. Um, mm -hmm. He's also involved in Eva Lotta Brackemeyer, as I mentioned. Anyway, so one very important next step is gathering data, and for that we developed an app, a smartphone app. That allows mm -hmm. you to um, uh, to capture essential um, uh, uh, processes, um, but kind of boiled down. We call it the process-based assessment tool that we've also wow, published great. in uh, in uh, 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 Joe Cariocci and others, um, and and I and, and I and Steve. Uh, we we published that, and and so we trans related that into an app. Uh, Steve is, has worked with a particular company that to convince them, it's actually a non-for-profit company, to convince them that we should develop that further. And, and we are inviting clinicians to to adopt it and to use that uh, is freely available. Uh, people can, can download it. And, uh, Where and, and would you like? So uh, I would... Uh, uh, I would, let me think, uh, the best way of... Uh, doing that is probably getting in touch with me directly. If you are interested okay. in using it in your clinic, uh, we would invite you to be part of uh, this group of uh, really? interested people to doing prospects. The, the a critical issue is now the translation of the, of the, of the items into the various mm -hmm. languages. We're now working on, Obviously, the first step is to to turn it into German language because it is, exists already in English. But yes. um, but if you if your um, uh, listeners, uh, for example, want to adopt it in Polish, we actually want to modify the software such that it can be easily done yeah, uh, right. using great translator and yeah. But uh, so uh, if somebody is interested, particularly if you're interested in doing that with uh, with a uh, in a clinic setting with um, uh, with a number of uh, individuals, that would be wonderful. Uh, get in touch with me. My yeah. email. Uh, I'm not sure if you're posting that on your podcast or if you or want to, I... because it's your so it's confidential. S -S so so. It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's quite okay. So it's s hoffman at bu dot edu s h o f m a n n one f two n's at uh, bu as in Boston University dot edu s hoffman at bu dot edu. I'm happy to um to liaison with you. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I think that I have a lot of uh, very, um, like a lot of new information about the process-based CBT and uh, new approach to the and uh, diagnosing the yeah and and thank you very much for the interview it was a big pleasure and i'm very grateful to you that, that that you are here with me yeah and thank you very much thank you very much adam it's always a pleasure talking to to thank uh, you to you about that thank you <laughs>